Hello everyone and welcome back to Lucky Loaders 15 where I'll be giving you my day 5 preview for Royal Ascot, the final day of the Royal Meeting and I'll be giving you tips in all 8 races. Now before we get stuck into those selections I just want to say it was another profitable day for us today, that was our third consecutive day of profits. Uh, we just had the one winner in the end today uh, which was Learjet advertised at 6-1 to one each way last night for Oshin Murphy and Michael Bell. He stayed on really strongly in the end and he battled well to get up on the line and that was a really nice win. So really pleased about him. He definitely helped uh, helped us today, definitely uh, made it a profitable day for us. But away from that, we had um, again some more each way bets. I think I've worked out this week, we've had something like 15 profitable each way bets. I'm just an each way thief. Um, but uh, yeah, keep busy. She finished in second place. Uh, Advertised last night at 11 to 1, but she was round about an 8 or 7 to 1 shot with a lot of firms this morning. She was well supported. She ran an incredible race to finish second place behind Art Power. The reason I didn't tip up Art Power was because he was so short. I, I did say last night in my preview that I think he could win and he was the one that they had to beat because he was a horse that I was really impressed with when he won at Newcastle in his seasonal debut. But I just thought that in a handicap like this I think he went off maybe I'm not sure what his final SP was but he was running about six to four at one point and that's about the same amount of profit uh, you would have made if you'd bet uh, keep busy each way with the fifth of the odds N not too dissimilar you know so so yeah it, it, it was a it wasn't a bad performance from Keep Busy, but Art Power, you know, he, he could be a special horse uh, going going forward. He might be a, a serious rival to Batash, but um, I think he would have to go and prove it in a group company for me. He is definitely uh, going to be worthy now of taking his chance in a group race, but uh, yeah, he'll have to do it next time out. He's done a good job so far. I think they're taking the right approach with him slowly, but cautiously going to go through the ranks with him, and I think uh, he will be a superstar over the sprint trips later on this season so art power was a good result another each way for us was satahi who did everything wrong pretty much like her debut she did she didn't like exactly improve from it she wasn't more streetwise she um she kind of was one of the slowest away and then at one point she was at the back and she was quite outpaced and then andrea azani switched towards the stand side and to be honest being against the stand side today on the straight course was again the place to be um um, even though the Learjet did win from Stool 1, they've been racing towards the middle a bit more, but it still pays to be um, on the stand side in these big handicaps compared to the far side. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, Satahi, uh, she was outpaced at a key stage, but uh, ran on really well to finish in second place. Maybe she might want seven furlongs in time. I think she's going to go further up in trip. I don't think five and six furlongs will be her forte. I only see her going up in trip, but uh, the Carl Burke filly that won the race was a really nice one, but it'd be interesting to see where she goes next. Our other um, each way selection was Indianapolis, 20 to 1, pretty much was the gamble of the day in the Duke of Edinburgh handicap. Uh, 20 to 1 into, I think it went off nearly 7 to 1 in the end. If you had gotten the early prices, that would have been again a great um, each way bet. There were multiple places out there. I think five or six uh, places were being paid out by some firms, so you could have definitely got that out there. And Indianapolis finished in fifth place. The North uh, winner for me was Scarlet Dragon because that was one I nearly did did put up but uh, I, I can only say that in hindsight now but yeah Indianapolis not complaining ran all right and uh, might be one for uh, future handicaps later on in the season if he could maybe get dropped I don't know maybe a pound or two I think he I think the handicappers um he ain't got much much room off his mark, but I think once he gets down to maybe a mark of 95, 96, he could easily feature in some of those nice uh, staying races at like Haydock and York, those kind of places. Definitely one to keep on side. We'll talk, and then also as well, um, we'll talk about the three o'clock race at Hardwick. Uh, two um, two sides of the story there for us. We'll get the positive out of the way first because I'll have a little rant in a minute um, about Ryan Moore. But um, yeah, uh, Alakam was the lay of the day again. Another uh, successful lay. Five uh, winners from uh, seven uh, bets on the lay front. So that's really good for us there. Uh, so we're starting to get that strike rate up now. And 
taken on these uh, short priced uh, horses that sometimes I think they're not that they don't deserve to be that price or the trainers bonkers trying them at that that trip or throwing them in that race yeah Alok Khan I never thought he would stay and I was proved right to me he's a group two specialist over 10 furlongs I think if he maybe if he is ever going to win a group one it's going to be the Judmont International at York that's where he will be most effective and I think he was a bit unlucky last year not to get involved uh, more I think he was badly hampered at one point but yeah uh, no more than 10 furlongs for for me uh, with him so uh, that's where I would uh, be aiming his uh, main target this season and it probably is his main target as well but they would just probably maybe wanted to experiment up and trip but uh, yeah the, the the annoying one of the day was uh, Anthony Van Dyke the nap now I think Anthony Van Dyke could have won that race um he, he was being asked for a little bit of an effort um, with a f several furlongs to go by Ryan Moore. But he was responding. And then when they came uh, round, round the bend and swung into the home turn, it got into a bit of a messy affair with Defoe. I think Andrea Azani did nothing wrong. He was perfectly entitled to keep his horse from where he was. But it's just frustrating because time after time, I just keep seeing Ryan Moore get into traffic problems more often than not. And it's just something I've noticed more um, in the last couple of years. Um, you look at now in the big races, yeah, he won the thousand guineas recently with love. But when it comes to Bally Doyle, he doesn't seem to ride the number one horse to victory every time. You look at the likes of Donacher O'Brien last year, cleaning up a lot of the big winners for him. You look at Shaney Heffernan, Padre Beggy even, you know, getting amongst the Group 1 winners. He's not riding the top horses at their best, I think, sometimes. Um, I think Ryan, when he when he's maybe from the front and he's dictating a race, that's where he's he comes into his own and he deserves his, pl his uh, plaudits as a jockey. But uh, I think... If he's ever a horse that's uh, coming up, coming up and looking for a run, uh, holding up a horse um, in a big field, he's definitely not the one to 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 really follow. You you can go back and watch Sir Isaac Newton when he ran in the Jersey Stakes a few years ago. Uh, that was a classic case of Ryan Moore kind of not being able to get out of traffic or not maybe being brave enough sometimes but it's just one of those things in racing but it's just so frustrating because more often than not when it comes to all the top riders I don't see him getting criticized enough for it um a lot of people will will um say that yeah he's a great jockey he's he's one that divides opinion but I've just seem to notice more and more people in the last year or so saying Ryan hasn't been at the top of his game and I don't think he's been at the top of his game people that have been following me for the last year or so will know that I, I think he's a Marmite jockey and I think he's hot and cold he's either on it or he's off it and it was typical you know he had a shocker on Anthony Van Dyke but then an hour later he's winning on Santiago you know and he judges the pace to perfection but uh, yeah it's one of those things in racing but Ryan Moore he, he's not my favourite jockey I'm not going to lie um, he doesn't often fill me with confidence even though I have tipped up one of his horses tomorrow and he better give it a damn good ride um, but uh, yeah for me, he, he he's 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 not my he's not my cup of tea most of the time, um, and that's why I often take on eight O'Brien no sources, believe it or not. Uh, I, I often take on more of them than I than I back them. Um, normally because of Ryan, actually, I don't always trust him to to get the job done, and I, I often look at what else. Um, what else? Um, Bally Doyle are sending, and I might go for one of their other horses. But yeah, they're just. It's just one of those one of those things, and I'm sure he might come back in the future. But yeah, Ryan Moore at the moment, he's definitely blown hot and cold. He he gave Uzo a shocker earlier in the week. You might remember. I don't even though Uzo was away. Um, slow slowly, he did do. He he gave it a bizarre ride still. I thought so. Uh, yeah, he's he, he's just one of those things. Let me know in the comments box below what you think about Ryan Moore. I'd uh, love to know your guys' opinions. I just think more should be spoken about it in the race and media because it's one of these things that I see. It's not just people, angry people talking out their mouth if they've lost a bet from him. I've seen quite a lot of people on social media that aren't into betting, that are just followers of horse racing and criticise him. You know, I think we need to have this discussion, you know, instead of saying every time he's a world-class jockey every five minutes, when the fact is, I think in the last couple of years, he's definitely not been at his best. And now of Frankie and, and Ryan, Frankie is hands and heels and O'Sheen now is coming. I think O'Sheen's ahead of Ryan Moore. Um, even Mark Wand is getting there, you know. It, 
he, he, I, I'm not seeing Ryan Ryan maintaining his good form from maybe a few years ago. Um, something's definitely definitely gone on. I feel and I, he's not always getting on, like I said, on the number one horse. But yeah, let me know in the comments box below about Ryan Moore. Uh, I'd love to know your guys' opinions and also as well what you're going to be back in tomorrow. I really enjoy our conversation. So leave your comments in the comments box below. Uh, our other final tip I'll just mention was Pierre Lepin. Um, not sure really what happened to him. I think he looked really inexperienced. He looked well in the paddock, to be fair to him. But yeah, who knows? Too bad to be true, I think. I think maybe maybe it just came for him a little bit too early in his career. Um, so I felt I fell for the sexy horse. I'm not going to lie. I don't often fall fall for them, but the solid candidate was Golden Horde, and I would definitely be in favour of following Golden Horde. Maybe for a race like the July Cup. I think he's I think he's going to be um, a nice horse this season and he definitely looked really well in the paddock. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's been a good day for us today. I'm not complaining too much except from the ride about Anthony Van Dyke. Um, but yeah, like I said, we had a winner. We had a few each ways and our lay of the day came in and hopefully we can continue that form into tomorrow. But anyway, enough of me rambling on. Let's get into the tips, something that you all want to hear. And we'll be going through all eight races tomorrow. Now we're going to start off in the 1240, the Silver Wokingham Handicap, one of the new races. We're actually starting with my next best here, and I'm going with Pass the Vino, uh, some some for the wine lovers there. Currently 18 to 1 with bookmakers at the moment, six places on offer with uh, the, the most places I've seen out there. I think Skybet paying six places, if I remember. Trained by Paul Darcy and uh, Johnny Egan's but for the ride. Now, Paul Darcy actually does well with his sprinters in handicaps. He's he's had a couple of uh, big winners at Ascot before on the Saturday, so not a, not a negative from the trainer and whatsoever. But this uh, horse was very progressive last year as a three-year-old. Did really well, won a, won a nice race. I um, can't remember where it was now. I think it was a new market, but ran some really good races later on after that. Um, and finished second here on uh, Shergar Cup Day uh, when he was being ridden by Hayley Turner. Finished second that day over six furlongs and he was only just mugged on the line by Victory Day who had who had the stand side rail to help him. But uh, he's off a one pound lower mark now and I think his reappearance run when he um, finished third last time out was a really good effort at Newmarket. I think off a mark of 94, he's still very capable. They actually sent him over to South Korea last year. He ran in the Patton Company race, so they do think a lot about him. He's drawn in still six tomorrow, which I think if they can get him down the middle of the track, you know, it isn't the right side to be on. But he's not he's not in still like one, two, three or four, you know, still six. It's not the worst draw in the world. Um, if if you can get down the middle um, under Johnny Egan, you know, uh, I think he's got a good chance. And Johnny Egan's been riding fair to, to his credit. He ran a fair race today with William Haggis's horse, um, which finished third in the Palace of Holyrood handicap. You know, so past Savino, you know, I think I think there's a lot more to come from him, and he's definitely going to be one to keep on side with in handicaps this year. And I just thought eighteen to one, you know, I thought he beat some of these rivals last time last time out. He's definitely going to be a massive player. And each way at 18-1, to 1, I think that's cracking value. And that's why he's going to be my next best. We then go to the 115, the Group 2 Queen Mary Stakes. Now, I know there are a lot of nice fillies in here. But I thought Happy Romance could uh, be the one to be with here. She's actually got the most experience in the field. Because she's run twice. And I believe every other filly in this race has run once. And I think that extra run could hold her in good stead. And she's a massive price again with the four places on offer at 11 to 1. I think that's crazy. Trained by Richard Hannon and Sean Levy's but for the right. Now, if you go back and watch the run on debut at Newmarket, this horse was quite unlucky. Got hampered early on. But um, she, once she got going in the last furlong, she'd travelled really strongly under a hands and heels ride by Sean Levy. Now, that day, she bumped into Sacred, who's going to be running in the Chiefly Park colours tomorrow. More went right for Sacred in that race than Happy Romance. And Sacred got a nice toe towards the rail just off the pace and came on really strongly. And it was a nice debut. And that form has worked out really well because our horse, Happy Romance, then went on to Sandown last weekend and absolutely bolted up under a hands and heels ride. Sean Levy didn't have to get the whip out at all. And I think that that little bit of experience could make the difference tomorrow in a race like this, where a lot of these fillies still very inexperienced, even though Happy Romance, is you know she that, that extra run I think did her the world of good and I think this filly's only going to improve and the form from that new market race has worked out okay because the the horse of Rafe Beckett's called Timescale went on to win a fairly useful uh, maiden at uh, Chepstow earlier in the week so so the form's looking all right there and I thought uh, 11 to 1 happy romance you know she 
came on bundles for that debut effort at Newmarket, she could reverse the form with Sacred. And even though there are some nice fillies in the race, Happy Romance represents a lot of good value, in my opinion. And that's why I'm going for her in the Queen Mary. We then go to the Coventry, the 150, one of my favourite races normally of Royal Ascot, normally one of everybody's favourites. But I'm going to go with a bit of an outsider here with a horse called Talbot for Tom Marquand and Brian Meehan. Now this horse is 14 to 1 with bookmakers at the moment. Again, there's extra places on offer. This horse is by Glen Eagles. And this horse I thought was a really impressive winner on his debut at Lingfield um, when he won very impressively beating a horse called Jojo Rabbit of Archie Watsons, who they hold in high regard. That horse then went on to boost the form by winning at uh, Wolverhampton next time out and beat one or two useful types in there as well by four lengths. So you've got to think that that performance by Talbot was really good. And if you watched the replay, he was flying home at the end. And Oshin Murphy, that was aboard that day, really struggled to pull him up. And six furlongs, I think, is going to be his bag. I expect him to be hitting the line hard tomorrow. And at a price, I think he represents good each way value. Still seven, so towards the middle of the track shouldn't be an issue. Glen Eagles is a sir that I've got lots of time for. And Brian Meehan Stable have been in okay form. They had a winner today at Newmarket and a couple of their other horses at Royal Ascot. They didn't, they didn't win, but they ran respectably, making the frame. So, yeah, I just think Talbot tomorrow uh, could be one the market might miss, you know, and he, and he might not get support that well supported, but uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he ran a very big race. And with some of these horses, we don't know so, that much about them. He's got as good a chance as any and was very impressive on his debut. So, uh, 14 to 1, he, he'll do for me. We then go to the 225 and the Coronation Stakes. Now, this is one of the feature races of the day, Group 1. Getting a lot of the 1,000 guineas form coming back here with Cloak of Spirits, Quattrilateral. Cloak of Spirits is a horse that I've got lots of time for. But I'm just wondering, mate, is something lurking in here that's a little bit better? Um, quadrilateral, she's not my kind of horse, really. Roger Charlton, um, yeah, Roger Charlton, he, he's a trainer that I like in handicaps with three and four year olds progressing them through. When he's got like a really good one on his hands, I know he did it with Al Kazim, but three year old fillies, um, Roger Charlton, it doesn't really go, does it, in a group one company? It's just not, it's just not something. Just something about her that I'm, I'm not so, I'm not, so, I'm not, I'm just not keen with that. Um, I know Alpine Star for Jessica Harrington will have um, her support as well. Frankie's been booked to ride that one, but I'm going to take a flyer here on one of the outsiders of the field, and that's the the Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien combination, the Bally Doyle runner of So Wonderful. Now she's eleven to one with bookmakers at the moment, and some firms are paying out free places as an extra place, even though there's only seven runners in this. So if you can get that, I'd recommend this horse at eleven to one. I've just got the feeling it's one of those races that could just spring spring a surprise. Now So Wonderful actually it st still remains a maiden. She actually finished um, third last time out at uh, the Curra and the one th Irish 1,000 guineas. And I think the Irish 1,000 guineas was actually a better race than the English 1,000 guineas. Some of you might say I'm mad, but I, I actually don't think love is that good. That's just my own personal opinion. And I think Peaceful is the best filly. You know, Aidan O'Brien Judd. And I think the fillies are far better this year. Uh, the three-year-olds, anyway. They're far better than the boys. And uh, this horse, so wonderful. I thought she, she dug really deep. What she'd done really well to dig deep last time out at the car. The only concern is the run might come too soon, but like a lot of Aiden O'Brien's horses, they, they seem to come forward a lot for that first run. You look at the likes of Russian Emperor coming on a lot. Anthony Van Dyke, I think, could have won today. He would have come on from that first run, you know. Um, I think a lot of these early ones are coming on battlegrounds, you know. You're looking at horses that have already run, I think, and and they're going to take that step. And so wonderful, I think, we'll do that. She reminds me a bit of Forever Together uh, that broke her her, um, her her maiden tag in a in a group one. I just think it's got it's got an absolute shock result, this race tomorrow. I don't fancy any of the main protagonists at all. And I just thought I'd take a flower on one here. So wonderful. Small stakes each way at 11 to 1. But yeah, she, she could definitely um, run well and go very close. And normally probably be one of those typical Ryan Moore rides, you know, comes up spring of surprise that, that he can do from time to time. So uh, that's going to be the selection there. We then go to the three o'clock, the St. James's Palace. And I'm going I'm to have to stick with Palace Pier here. I've loved this horse since his debut. I actually put him up ages ago when he actually won on debut as my nap. 
I always thought he would be a very good horse. Two out of two from um, last season when he won both times at Sandown. And now a lot of people are going to go go and watch Newcastle run where he, he showed a great turn of speed to beat a quid. Now, I, I wouldn't suggest for you to go and watch that run. I'd suggest for you to go back and watch his second win at Sandown. Now, at the furlong pole, he looked like he was going to have to really fight for the win. But... Boy, when he got going in the last furlong, he flew up that hill. I think he won by like seven or eight lengths in the end. He's by Kingman, so he's going to be a mile, uh, ten furlongs. He's going to be running in Sussex Stakes. These kind of races, you know, I thought this race would always been on his radar. I'm pleased John Gosden missed the Guineas as well, because I don't think the Guineas is actually that good. I don't think it's going to work out that well. Um, you know, a bit controversial for me to say that. And my lay of the day is going to come in this race as well. Pinatubo. I mean, I think Pinatubo should have run in the Commonwealth Cup today. I don't, I don't think he'll stay a mile. Some people might say the sharpness of coming off the bend might help him, but but I thought, I I thought he 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 in the, when 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 they get to seven furlongs, I think other horses are going to have more of a kick, and I don't think he'll have that extra gear to live up with the horses that are bred to go over further, like Palace Pier. I think Palace Pier. When say like for example they're both running at seven furlongs, I can just see Palace Pier coming with that extra kick and accelerating and going on, and I don't see Pinatubo go going that extra forward, and that's why Pinatubo is going to be my lay of the day. I'm not I'm not convinced he's going to win another Group One. He could easily I could have an egg on my face, and he could win tomorrow. Obviously he was unbelievable last year, winning six starts, but I made my case, and if you, if you didn't you haven't been following me, and you've only just started following me this week. Um, if you're not aware, I was totally against Pinatubo for the Guineas. I, I I often always take the angle that these two-year-olds, they're not going to be good three-year-olds. You can go back through history, Celtic Swing, Arazi, going back many many years ago, horses that had high two-year-old ratings that ran a lot. They never quite went and did it as a three-year-old. I know Frankel obviously was unbelievable, um, but Frankel was quite likely raced for two, and he came more, more to himself as a three-year-old, you know. And I just think that the, the biggest mistake they made with him was running him in the Dewhurst. They should have put him away after the, the national stakes. But obviously you get carried away in the momentum, you know. You're probably going to want to get him back out again. But for me, Pinatubo, he's gone at the game. Wichita is the one I think Palace Pier has to be. I think Wichita was very impressive. Even though I did just say the guineas for him, I don't think it'll work out well. I think if you had to take the two, the two horses from the, or the three horses from the race, it would have been Wichita, it would have been Kamiko and Military March. I think the rest weren't that good, um, you know. And they're the three horses that I think you'll have to take from the guineas moving forward for the season. And for me, I don't think Pinatubo will ever win a Group One again unless they run him back down at six furlongs, you know. I think that's that's his trip over seven furlongs a mile. I think he's gone, gone at the game, and they should be going back down in trip, not keeping him here. But that's just my opinion. Let me know in the comments box below. Are you gonna give Pinatubo a second chance? I'm certainly not. I think he could maybe finish third, but he he's just gonna be a win lay tomorrow, not a place lay. So yeah, he's currently two point nine six on the Betfair exchange, and that's why I'm going with him. Back to Palace Pier, finally. I think he's definitely going to be uh, one of the standout stars this season. There was one or two concerns in the interview about John Gosden saying the ground might just be a little bit soft, you know. But so what? Stradivarius, he was saying about the ground, maybe he's just getting his, his excuse ready. There, there were vibes as well, actually, that Palace Pier, a couple of months ago, he wasn't working that well on the gallops. But I think that proved to be false with his Newcastle performance, which was very good. And I think the the further this horse goes, the better. And he, he'll do he'll do all his best work late on. And I can see him coming off tomorrow. Frankie maybe just sitting off the leader, and then what? Whoever makes the running, and then when he says go, he goes. And at four to one, I think that represents value. And I'm just going to recommend a win only bet. Anyway, enough of me taking too much time up on the St James's Palace. We then go to the Diamond Jubilee Stakes, the three thirty five. I think this looks an average renewal. I was quite keen on the chances of Kate Byron but he set he suffered a setback uh, a couple of weeks ago so unfortunately he's not going to run but this is where my long shot's coming into play tomorrow where I'm going to take the whole rag of the field with breathtaking look currently 33 to 1 for Andrea Zaney and Stuart Williams I think six furlongs is a great um trip for this horse she was really progressive last year 
She got, uh, I think she won a Group 3 or listed race at Doncaster. I can't remember what class it was, but she won a Patton Company race at Doncaster last season. She really did improve, and I thought her run against Oxted was very good, and I think Oxted could be uh, a Group 1 quality sprinter in the making, you know, even though he's still got to go and prove it. I think he could be very good later on in this season. And this horse as well ain't got a bad draw tomorrow, drawn towards uh, the middle, towards the stand side. So that's not going to be an issue. And she can run over a mile and seven furlong. So, you know, she's not going to get tired. She's going to be doing all her best work late on. And if Andrea Zaney can get into a good position at 33 to 1, I think she's got a massive chance of going very close in what I think is a substandard jubilee. So that's going to be my selection. Now, I know some people are like sceptical, but for me, I'm not that keen on sceptical. I think they should have ran him in the King's Stand the other day, but that's just my own personal opinion. We then go to my nap, which is going to be in the Wokingham. Yeah, I like napping horses and big runner handicaps. And uh, in the 4.10 tomorrow, I'm going with Summer Gand. I think it's, it's time, his time. He's been threatening to win a big one for uh, David O'Meara. You know, he runs so well in these handicaps time after time. James Doyle's but for the ride. He actually finished fifth in this race last year in the Wokingham behind Kate Byron. You know, and he was running on really strongly. He can stay over seven furlongs. Thought he ran a really good race last time out behind um, Tinto, who he's going to reoppose. And Tinto will have to give four pounds this time to some again. So that's going to be good. He beat Parsavino as well. So I'm hoping that bit of form is going to be the key bit of form surrounding both Wokinghams tomorrow. I think some again, he ran on really strongly in the end and still 14. Good draw, plumb down the middle, you know, no excuses. And for me, if he can get a clear passage through, which he will have to do in these big handicaps, you know, six places, 10 to 1, I think it could be Summer Gans time. And that's why he's going to be my nap tomorrow. We then end with the last race, the Queen Alexandra Stakes. I'm going with the Grand Vizier here, win only bet, 4 to 1 for uh, Richard Kingscote and Ian Williams. Won the Ascot Stakes last year very well to be, um, to be, uh, Willie Mullins' his horse, uh, the name escapes me now, he used to be with Mick Shannon, um, I'm not going to remember it, uh, but uh, yeah, this horse, you know, I think it's my butter, butter, cl butter cups, I think, you guys tell me in the comments box below, I'll remember it straight away after this video, but uh, build me up buttercup, that's the horse, um, but yeah, the Grand Vizier beat build me up buttercup last year, and uh, was quite progressive really for Ian Williams, he got a good tune out of him, and he goes well fresh. He's won fresh before after long breaks. And I think Ian Williams will have him spot on for this. Um, you know, and I think he, he's got a solid chance. He's by Frankel. He used to be trained by William Haggis, actually. And I think tomorrow, who dares wins is his main market danger, you know, for Alan King, who's been a credible servant to that yard. But for me, in what is... I'm probably not going to be watching this race, to be honest with you. You'll probably be watching the football scores coming in. But yeah, Grant, the Grand Vizier, you know, at four, 4 to 1. I think that represents good value. And I think he'll do as my final tip of the day. And fingers crossed, he can do the job. So that's my final uh, thoughts for the final day of Royal Ascot. Just finally recap it. 12-14, the Silver Wokingham, Parsavino, next best. 18-1 to 1 each way for Johnny Egan and Paul Darcy. 115, Queen Mary, Happy Romance. 11-1 to 1 each way for Richard Hannon with the four places. The Coventry, the 150, Talbot for Tom Marquand and Brian Meehan. 14-1 to 1 each way, four places. 225 Coronation Street, uh, not Coronation Street, Coronation Stakes, so wonderful, 11 to 1 each way with the three places. And then to St. James's Palace, Palace Pier, um, 4 to 1, win bet for Frankie the Tory and John Gosden. My long shot in the Diving Jubilee, 335, breathtaking look, uh, with I should have said the extra places, four places, 33 to 1. Uh, rag of the field for Stuart Williams in the 410. The Wokingham Mistakes, my nap, some again at 10 to 1 each way with six places. And then my final tip in the Queen Alexandra Stakes, 440. Grand Vizier for Richard Kingscote and uh, Ian Williams at 4 to 1, win only bet. So that's all I've got to say about that. So if you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe here for more videos here on my YouTube channel. I'll be doing lots more videos away from Royal Ascot. I do videos every day, so make sure you follow me. Also as well, if you want to follow me on social media, the best place to go is my Twitter feed, which is at LuckyLoads15. That's my handle. You can check out my website as well for more links to all my work, which is www.chrisloaderacing.co.uk. Please gamble responsibly. Hopefully we can have a final profitable day of Royal Ascot and we'll be seeing you soon.